Chapter 7, Section 1. In Calculus 1, we were taught various processes for differentiation. Now, for instance, to find the derivative of x squared, we would bring the exponent of 2 down and multiply by the constant in front of x, which in this case is 1, and then subtract 1 from the exponent to get 2x. So 2x is the derivative of x squared. Conversely, x squared is what we call an antiderivative of 2x when we go in the other direction. In this chapter, we'll learn how to find antiderivatives for various functions. So let's start with some terminology. If capital F of x represents the antiderivative, and little f of x represents the derivative, then we can say that the derivative of capital F of x is little f of x. This is shown as capital F prime of x equals little f of x. For example, if capital F of x equals x squared, then capital F prime of x, which equals little f of x, is the derivative, which we know is 2x. Let's look at some more basics. How else can we get 2x as a derivative from x squared? What if our original function had a constant in it? What if capital F of x was x squared plus 3? or if capital F of x was x squared minus 289. Notice the derivatives of these functions are both 2x. Why? Because when we have a constant and you take the derivative, it disappears. So that constant doesn't affect the derivative. So let's take this possibility into consideration by adding a constant c to our antiderivative function. So if capital F of x is x squared plus any constant c, then the derivative, capital F prime of x, equals little f of x, will be 2x. This is what we call the indefinite integral. To show that we're taking an antiderivative through integration, we use the integral of some function dx. Note that the symbol we use looks a lot like the definite integral that we've been working with, but without the lower and upper limits a and b. So now, let's put this all together. If we integrate a function, f of x dx, which was a derivative of some function, we get the original function back plus some constant c. Now that we know how it's supposed to look, let's learn how to find these antiderivatives. We'll do all the basic ones now. If you have x to some power of n, then our antiderivative is calculated by adding 1 to the power and dividing by that new power. For example, if we want to find an antiderivative of x squared, we'll add 1 to the power, so now the power becomes 3, and divide by the new power. So our antiderivative is x cubed divided by 3. Now if we want to check our work and make sure we did it right, we can always take the derivative and make sure we get back the original function. So if our antiderivative is x cubed over 3, then our derivative the 3 will come down, it'll cancel with that 3 on the bottom, subtract 1 from the power, and we're left with x squared. That's what we started with, so we know that our antiderivative is correct. So the general form looks like this. The integral of x to the n dx is x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus some constant c. Notice that n cannot equal negative 1. That's a special case that we'll address later. Let's look at an example. If we want to find the antiderivative of x to the 7th, again, we add 1 to the power, and we divide by the new power, and then we have to add our constant c. So that gives us x to the 8th over 8 plus c as our antiderivative of x to the 7th. What if we start with a constant? Say the number 5, the number 10. Well, what happens is when you integrate a constant to find the antiderivative, the constant will pick up the variable of integration, which here is x because we're integrating over dx. And then again, we add this plus constant because we know when we take the derivative, the constant goes away. Let's do an example. Find the antiderivative of 8. So if you're integrating 8, the integral of 8 dx, again, the 8 will just pick up the variable of integration x, plus c. 
So our answer here, our antiderivative, is 8x plus c. And again, we can quickly check and make sure that the derivative is our original function. The derivative of 8x is 8, and the c goes away. So again, we get it back our original function. Sums and differences. If you integrate two functions that are either added or subtracted, you can integrate them each individually and add and subtract what you get. For example, find the antiderivative of x plus x squared. Well, the antiderivative of x plus x squared, since it's separated by addition, can be written as the antiderivative of x plus antiderivative of x squared. Using our x to the n rule, we look at the first integral of x, and we remember that there's an invisible power of 1 there that we don't usually write. So when we add 1 to the power, it becomes x squared, and we divide by the new power, so x squared over 2. Now our second integral is x squared. We add 1 to the power, which gives us x cubed, and we divide by the new power. So now we have x cubed over 3 as the second term. Then, of course, we have to remember to add plus c, because our antiderivative can have any constant it wants and still be a correct antiderivative. Let's look at another example. Find the antiderivative of x to the negative 3 minus x to the 4th. Again, when we do the antiderivative, we can do each piece separately because they're separated by subtraction. Now, be very careful with the negative exponent. When we integrate x to the negative 3, we're going to add 1 to the power, so negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2, and divide by the new power. So when we divide by negative 2, the 2 goes in the bottom, and we can write the negative out front. So that's our first term. Minus x to the fourth. So again, we add 1 to the power to become x to the fifth, and we divide by that new power of 5. And of course, we have our plus c. If you have a constant in front of your function, it's equivalent to pulling that constant out front of your integral. For example, if we want to find the antiderivative of 4x squared, we start with integral of 4x squared. We can pull the 4 out front. Now, we know how to integrate x squared from our last couple of slides. So we have 4 times, and now the term that we get for our antiderivative, we add 1 to the power, so we have x cubed divide by the new power of 3. Since 4 is a constant, it multiplies into the numerator, giving us 4x cubed over 3. Let's do one more. Find the antiderivative of 8x to the negative 3. So again, we set up our basic integral, 8x to the negative 3. We pull the 8 out front, and now we integrate using our x to the n rule. When we add 1 to the power, negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2 divide by the new power, so we get a negative 2 on the bottom. So now again, the 8 can go into the numerator, so we have 8x to the negative 2 over negative 2. We can simplify, 8 divided by negative 2 is negative 4x to the negative 2. What about natural log in e? Notice that 1 over x is the case of x to the n, where n equals negative 1. It's our special case here. If you remember, the derivative of natural log was 1 over x. So naturally, when you integrate 1 over x, you get the natural log of x back, plus a constant. Now notice that the natural log of x is only going to be defined for positive values. So we get the absolute value symbols when we integrate. Similarly, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So that means when we integrate e to the x, we get the same thing back, plus a constant. Now what if we have e to some constant times x? Well, the antiderivative will be 1 over that constant times the original function, e to the kx, plus c. Let's look at an example of this. Find the antiderivative of e to the 3x. Well, again, we're going to get the same thing back, this e to the 3x, but in front, we're going to have a 1 over whatever our constant is, which here was 3. So we have one-third e to the 3x, and of course, plus c.